So, um, filmmaking, okay, so start me off from, so first things first, um, what was the, what's the start point for you with filmmaking, where did you begin? As in when did I first make a film, when did I first get into Going right the way back, I mean literally before, before anything else, before features, everything, like where did, how, where does it begin for you as a filmmaker? Mm. Weirdly enough, my first ever memory yeah. is of Jill. I've okay. seen the film Jewel, the Steven Spielberg TV movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember being in a living room with my mum um, and seeing the film and then narrating a story to her and getting her to write it down. So this is your and first memory? Like my first memory, yeah. Wow, so even uh, the, even in terms of your memory begins with film. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then I acted it out for her. I mean, it was a story about a man being chased by a werewolf or something. Okay. <laughs> um, similar to like the Jewel kind of, you know, cat yeah. and mouse. And yeah, acted it out and got her to write it down. So that was literally my first memory. Wow. Um, and it's related to film, bizarrely enough. Yeah. But that's not to say that then growing up, I always wanted to make film. Okay. It wasn't until really I was like a teenager. Um, my first short film, I was like 14 years old. Okay, and how did you make it. that? How, did you, how was that made? <laughs> it was made, my dad uh, bought us a Video 8 camera, which was before like uh, the Hi8 yeah. kind of thing, uh, way before DV. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So Video 8, it was a big Christmas, family Christmas present. Um, and basically we had that kind of just we didn't really use it to make films or anything it was more for filming family stuff um and then around the age of 14 i made my first short film with it right um and the short film was based on i was reading a book about charles manson <laughs> um, by ed sanders called the family and it was all about how charles manson was influenced by the white album by the beatles wow um, so I made a short film that was called there was a track on the White Album called Revolution 9 and there was a track um, and basically Charles Manson related that to Revelations yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the Bible so I wrote uh, this short film called Revolution Revelation 9 and it was literally the Beatles track Revolution 9 <laughs> with all these shots I'd filmed from the book then I acted bits out, bits of like things that were written on the walls during the murders. I kind of mocked them up and basically <laughs> cut all these images. It was more of like a montage film. And is it just um, you in the film then, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, it's just like hands and things like that and mainly kind of me filming images. So. And how do you, and, and I mean, I, first thing, I mean, there's two questions really. So how do you explain that to your mum and dad? You know, you're, you're making a film inspired by Charles Manson and the Beatles. Um, and secondly, how do you cut that? How do you edit that? Okay, well, I mean, my parents were kind of... It was my dad's book, to Right, be yeah, yeah, okay, um, yeah. <laughs> And it was probably my parents' record of yeah. the Beatles' White Album. And following that, every film that I pretty much have made mm. has had my parents in. Yeah. Like, every single short film. Um, and all my features, they're in all of them. Okay. Uh, how I was cutting, yeah, because basically we had that Video 8 camera for quite a while. Right. Um, but... I basically had a VHS machine and used to run the um, video camera into the VHS machine yeah. and would have a VHS tape in there and have it on pause and record wow. and then I would play and fast forward yeah. on, on the actual camera itself so the feed was going into the video, um, the VHS player and out of the VHS player into the TV and I would find the right cut and pause yeah. record, you know, record it pause it but I'd, it, it was quite a discipline because it made me get every cut correct mm. and also the pause record function yeah if you left it i think more than three minutes it stops okay and then you would have a glitch in your in your film yeah because like, yeah. you couldn't do frame by no, frame you can't, you can't um time. so it'd mean like every time if i needed the toilet <laughs> i would have to pause record on a cut run to the toilet come back line up my next cut and hit pause record again so you would have to cut a short film in one sitting yeah yeah, yeah. Um, there's no there's, you can't go back and, and no, it's, no. Yeah, it's not, not, not and if you did mess any cuts up you'd have to recut the entire film wow uh, so that that's how I learned to edit which was just basically domestic and you kind of taught yourself I assume in that respect basically yeah, that's what you're yeah, doing yeah I mean I've never really differentiated editing as a role no um, from basically directing or yeah, filmmaking yeah. Um, to be honest I can't comprehend for me I find it hard defining exactly what a director is because for me as a director 
I cut my films. Yeah. Um, even my first two features where I worked very closely with Paco, who was my editor, mm. I would be in the edit pretty much with him every day and it would be very much a collaboration. And, and now I'm kind of like in a position where I do just cutting the film is still part of the directing and the creation of the entire piece. So, so it's kind of the whole process. Yeah, I can't, I, it's weird. I can't comprehend how a director would kind of just direct and then not be near the edit. Yeah. yeah Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's, yeah. So for you, it's very much about the ownership of the whole process then. And, and you would say that, I mean, are we seeing the, the, the start of that, you know, in making that first short film then? Is that Possibly. Right? I mean, I did everything. I did the camera. <laughs> Um, edited, acted yeah. in it, yeah, wrote it, directed. Um, I wouldn't say it's so much ownership of the okay. process though. Okay. But I do believe you're you're there to get everyone collaborating. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you're almost there as facilitator of the process. Mm. Though probably, yeah, secretly you are owning it. <laughs> so <laughs> there is ownership, I guess. Um, okay. And but what's interesting about um, about that I mean, where do you go from being you know fourteen years old? I mean, what's influencing you up to that point? Is it is it still is it still Jewel? Is it still Spielberg? Yeah, it's still Spielberg films. Okay. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I wasn't looking at anything quite avant garde or anything like that. Yeah, I remember yeah. my dad was in into Kurosawa films. Okay, um, but I didn't really watch loads of them. But you know, things like Seven Samurai. Um, Influenced by Scorsese films, okay. Taxi Driver, even at 14, 15. I mean, the, the key film for me at the age of 15 was seeing La Haine. Right, um, okay. The Matthew Kasovitz film. That yeah. just blew my mind. And also, I mean, reading Robert Rodriguez's Rebel Without a Crew and getting a copy of El Mariachi. Yeah. Um, you know, the film and the book, kind of the book probably more than the film in some yeah. respects, I would say, had a massive influence on, because you know I was just really playing around yeah. with filmmaking at that time. And how do you go from? So what comes after that? What what did you do after that? Did you did you make any more films on that? On yeah, the... I mean my next short film, literally back to back with that, was I remember it's one shot. Okay. Um, and the camera's <laughs> set like quite a low angle, um, and it is shot through a glass. Okay. And literally the short film is, um, it's called the morning after. And it just starts and you see someone kind of walk around, kind of distorted through the glass. Wow. Then suddenly they fill the glass up with water, which comes up in front of you. Then they drop in an aspirin and it fizzes. And then they just pulled the glass back and drank it. And that was the short film. And that was my dad in it. it was um, and then I remember I made like a documentary called What is Love? Yeah. Where I just interviewed all my family and friends uh, just the question of what is love mm. um, and I think I was still about 15 so, 16 then so so you're re by this point so this so you're really heavily you know you're heavily making films so you're yeah, yeah it's kind of like a hobby yeah. really like after school yeah um, just yeah make it, making films so um, you, you know it's literally is it's a, uh, it sounds like it's quite an experimental time and yeah. How does that fit with your your friends group? I mean, are you calling yourself a filmmaker by that point, or is it still just um, a hobby? Or yeah, I would say I wanted to be a film director, okay. and a filmmaker. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So the, yeah, so it's it's, it's starting to formulate yeah. for you. But it wasn't really my friends weren't into filmmaking. Right. Okay. Bizarrely, I never hung around with anyone that was into no. filmmaking, but that was kind of good. Yeah. Because my friends had really really tight friends from yeah. from about the same age actually and. That was a major influence. Like all the kind of things we used to get up to definitely like <laughs> were stories that formulated my first feature. Okay. So my friends, my friends, my teenage friends, yeah, it was like really tight group of friends, really. Um, so for, so from there, I mean, so you go to study, you study film at, uh, at college? Yeah, or? I was meant to do a degree. Um, originally, it was going to be in philosophy. And my, my dad actually wanted me to do like a degree. Um, okay. So it's like, you know, if you want to do filmmaking, at least you might have a degree to fall back on. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. But then at the last minute, I kind of pulled out of doing that, um, took a year out and worked doing some theatre jobs. And I should say even from like the age of 15, I was involved in doing lighting um, okay. and sound and later stage management and theatre stuff. At a really young age, I went to like the Edinburgh 
festival with a bunch of actors wow. and helped with the lighting from I was 15 yeah, um, yeah, yeah, when yeah, I did yeah. that so I kind of took a year out and then yeah basically went to art school in Farnham which was the Surrey Institute of Art and Design which was a, a great kind of degree because it was three yeah. years and we did like digital um, video but also we shot on 16 mil and we got to edit on steam so, machines I was going to ask so yeah. yeah it was the old cutting and splicing um, of film and I, I mean I loved that yeah, I loved yeah, yeah. that and I remember at the end of my first year I directed and basically edited a film on black and white non-sync 16 mil um, and then again going into the second year I directed a documentary and then directed a drama documentary which had my sister Becky acting in okay. which we shot on 16 mil and yeah and then into the third year I directed a film called Cages and then wrote a film called Front and another director, Dean Puckett, who's kind of gone on to do a lot of documentary work. Yeah. Um, director and did an incredible job. Um, but from that kind of hub of art school, Collective Vision was formed, which was kind of like 10 filmmakers yeah. working together. So it was around the third year where films like Cages and, like I say, Front was kind of the pinnacle of us leaving art school because most people from the collective yeah. worked on that. And... Um, we went from art school and remained in that collective and were putting on free cinema nights um, in Whitechapel and at the Portobello Film Festival as Collective Vision. And so you were kind of essentially, um, so basically you've made, you've made cages um, and you guys are finishing art school now. Yeah. And you're um, learning how to kind of own your own route or what, I mean, what's, well, the, what's the reason for it? No, I mean... To backtrack, actually, in that third year yeah. when I made Cages, the reason my th my final film, I just wanted to be the writer and not the director, okay. was because I was writing The Plague. Yeah, okay. Um, so I was in the process of writing The Plague. Um, and yeah, that's literally finished art school. And I think finished art school in May, June, and then in September, shot The Plague. Okay. So that was 2003. So you start filming in 2003 on The Plague. Um, film, yeah. I mean, that's. The, I mean, obviously, um, anyone who knows you probably knows of the plague. So, just tell me how that came about in the first place. How did you decide that you were going to make this film? Because so you started working on that before you finished. Yeah, I mean, I started writing the plague. I remember my my sister went travelling when I went to uni my first year. And I sent her a video okay. of me and I'd interview some of her friends. And in that video, I hold up a book and go, and "Look, I'm writing a film called The Plague." Right. So I'd been going, the idea had been from stories from me and my friends from the age of 15. So it'd been slowly writing itself, I, I, even over the process of like five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and by that third year, I basically just, yeah, kind of spent a month and every night was just writing on the plague. I was kind of writing five new pages and rewriting the previous five pages yeah, yeah. a night um, and just based it all around kind of stories from me and my friends growing up but say it more kind of in London because we were yeah, kind of yeah. from the, the sticks and the suburbs um, because I was also really influenced by UK hip hop Yeah. because at the time I was living with Jeet who's now my sound man um, we used to have a set of 12 tens and used to listen to like all UK hip hop vinyl oh, and it was like that time of UK hip hop which is early 2000s yeah um, artists were pressing up their own vinyl um, selling it themselves selling their own white labels um, kind of making it getting their own videos made I mean this is prior to things like YouTube and all yeah, that yeah 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 um, but that whole model of self distribution and kind of making your own stuff and putting it out really influenced the, of how you know the fact that I could just go out and make the plague yeah. on nothing so it's kind of influenced from those two elements really stories of growing up and then the the influence of the UK hip hop scene um, in London at that's, that time, and that's interesting because um, so basically, I mean, you know, the so you're you're writing the play. How do you know you're going to make it? At what point do you know that this is this is the film I'm going to make? Is it before you start writing it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so you did you decide that it was going to be very much a guerrilla thing that you were going to take those models that you already experienced that you had knowledge of and just produce a film in that way. Is yeah, that I mean, I don't think it was as obvious as picking a model or anything. Because no, no, I've been no. making short films since, like, say, 14. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of actually... I was just continuing... It's an organic process. To make yeah. 
films. Yeah, like yeah, my yeah. mum and dad again are in <laughs> the plague. Yeah, yeah, it's like of course. my sister would help me out with making it. Um, and people I was just working with that been involved in cages. Right, right, so right. It was just a natural progression. So it wasn't yeah. even a question of thinking, can I make a feature? Um, it was just like, well, this is the next thing to do, really, Super is crazy. make a feature film. Comes the obvious and just knew I could make yeah. it on no money. Never even doubted it, really. Um, okay. Because, again, I was making, started out making films in my kitchen and in my bedroom. And that was just how it, yeah, like you say, it was a progression. Okay. Um, and so, because, you know, going from, from, it's one thing, obviously, to make short films at home it's something else to kind of move into a feature surely so how do you start to bring that together what was the process i mean how did you find your actors how did you find mm, mm. your locations i mean how did you start to manage that 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 natural progression but how did you start to manage the workload that comes with that how did that yeah i mean that? initially obviously the idea for it had been in my head for a long time as i said but yeah my sister was working over at south Thames college and she said she's working with these young guys and they want to make short films. Okay. Um, and contact me and said, would I be up for coming in and filming? Um, so I went in for a session with them to check in on their scripts that she had developed with them and then went back and we shot their short films like a day on each one. Oh, cool. Um, and pretty much most of the guys in all those short films were the key actors right, um, right, right. that are in the plague. Because when doing those short films with my sister, I was like, these guys... I mean, you know, they, they yeah. can make the plague. That's what can make it happen because they're real, they're raw, they're young guys yeah, and girls, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, with really great acting talent, um, yeah. all of them. Uh, so that that's why it became a reality. So initially, I mean, you know, my sister was involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From um, and she was involved in getting them on board. Uh, I wrote it and I was pretty much producing it because it was so much to do. Mm. And I just moved just left art school and was living in Wolfenstow. My sister lived in Stratford, so I used to go around there a lot and just be doing stuff on it and she'd help out. And yeah. it just naturally came from there. And everyone that I was living in Wolfenstow with was yeah. also involved in helping make the film as well, pretty much. So, um, and that house we lived in, most that's all a Matt's house, the mm, main character. Yeah. Um, so it was <clears throat> locations, it was literally just asking as many people favors and the estate we shot in was the same estate the front was filmed in wow. um the short film that i wrote yeah so it's kind of again front doing that which is a short and one of the characters Callie, yeah the guy that does the credit card scam he continues from front right okay um, and i should say front is rashomon right okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. took the story of rashomon and reset it and that was based around a friend's um, experience of being involved in a credit card scam right, and I remember right, right. being at the court case and seeing all these people tell different accounts of it and I knew what had really gone on yeah. so that influenced Front but again that same friend and the other people I was hanging around with influenced the plague so the two were very close yeah. um, related so Front I kind of used to help write knew I wrote, you know, wrote the plague very quickly and like I say the whole production thing was just my sister and friends of, friends of mine, people involved in Collective Vision, very yeah. small unit, and Amazing. it just came together, really. Um, and what was the budget on the play again? £3,500. Okay, so that's, um, you know, even, you know, at any level, that's that's nothing, basically. Yeah, you know? I mean, and this is going back to 2003. Yeah, yeah, My yeah. stuff now is completely different with like DSLRs. Yeah, yeah. Um, even the editing software is completely different. Yeah. Everything is... It was a completely different age. Um, 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 so fill me in on the story of how play went. Um, obviously, I know I know uh, quite a bit of it, but I'm intrigued. So, how did so you've got the film? I mean, how long did it take to to complete the production? How long? Did uh, take? We shot for three weeks, and we yeah. didn't have one day off. Um, <laughs> so it's every day for three weeks, and there was night shoots in there as yeah, well. Yeah, it was yeah. grueling, mm. like, seriously grueling. And then you know, we shot it in September, and then my editor Paco. I was staying in a box room um, between two bedrooms and he moved in to sleep in between the doorway. <laughs> and yeah, he literally turned up with like a swivel chair, his computer and a yeah. water filter. That's all he had with him. Um, so, and we used to both stay in this tiny box room, we used to go work at a dubbing house during the mm. day and sometimes night shifts and be editing as much time as we could get on it. And 
took a couple of months. It was completed by, I think, May 2004. Okay. We had our cast and crew screening. So still quick turnaround, yeah, really. Yeah. And how old are you at this point? Um, it. I was actually 22 then. So 22. Because it had its public premiere. I was 23. Right. So you've I just think, yeah you've just completed it. So you've just got. I mean, obviously you've been making films by this point for what, about eight years, roughly eight nine years possibly. Yeah, yeah. So you think just, I was twenty three? Sorry, I think twenty three. Yeah. So you've just finished this edit. How do you know what to do with it next? Where does that come in? Didn't really. Okay. I mean, we had our cast and crew screening, um, and then tried sending out things to organise an industry screening. Um, didn't get many industry people there, but. The good thing with it, I mean, two things kind of happened with it. We entered it into a Portobello Film Festival. And the fact we had a, a, a rapper called Skinny Man um, on mm. board, again, for my love of UK hip-hop, I was able to get Skinny Man involved. And that was just as his first album was coming out. Um, and he's a massive kind of underground following. Yeah. So all the, I had a lot of support from the UK hip-hop community. Yeah, yeah. So the kind of niche of it, you know, was covered that side. So there was buzz about it. And then, obviously, from the industry screening, it was seen by Mike Lee, um, who then showed it to one of the other um, trustees from the Catch and Cartilage Foundation, and they agreed to um, give it the Catch and Cartilage Foundation wow. scholarship. Wow. And so we'd entered it into Portobello, and it had its um, public premiere in August, and then I think a couple of weeks later, it was at Sarajevo, where um was officially given the Catherine Cartledge scholarship. Wow. So within that one month, um, and we got the as I was picking up the Catherine Cartledge scholarship, the same day we were awarded. Um, I was awarded best director of the Portobello Film Festival. So on the same day we got two, you know, um, accolades. Yeah. Which, but the Catherine Cartledge thing was the thing that and being at Sarajevo, and then it went on to London Film Festival in the October wow. so this is all in a matter I mean we had a cast and crew yeah, in May yeah, yeah. by August that happened October was London Film Festival and obviously the London Film Festival because of um, you know the press it gets was a massive launch pad yeah. for the plague it really uh, created a name for itself then so you've done Portobello LFF and obviously Sarajevo as well when does the um when does everything start to hit for you? When does it start to really kind of take off? Um, it's hard to kind of pinpoint really because I don't think it was one of those ones where there was a moment that right. it had kind of taken off because actually it was over a long time period. Okay. I mean, between Sarajevo and London Film Festival, that was kind of getting a lot of industry kind of heat, things being in like, you know, Screen Daily, that kind of... All that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. At the London Film Festival, I spoke at like the Directors Guild of Great Britain um, with Hugh Hudson, um, the director of Chariots of Fire. Oh, wow. Um, who I'd met out in Sarajevo, and he had asked that I do the talk with him. So that yeah. was amazing. Um, and even being at Sarajevo, I met people like Gaspar Noe, the director of Irreversible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who bizarrely we both were going to the toilet at the same time and he, he <laughs> joked about comparing penis sizes um, and I was so nervous because I was like oh my god it's the director of Irreversible yeah, yeah I think my line was oh no yours is definitely bigger than mine um, <laughs> so it was kind of like it took yourself down yeah, yeah. yeah but I mean come 2005 we were involved in being like I think the second only ever feature film to be downloaded online of course yeah um all kind of it was slow actually it was going to kind of european festivals over 2005 at that time i was making music videos uh, with paco my editor yeah under the name of the beta brothers and we were doing a lot of work with benjamin zephaniah okay um and i was teaching doing teaching work as well so it's kind of like trying to maintain bits of work and paid work being really broke and scraping by and then one week then being at a festival in europe yeah, yeah and yeah. being you know described as like the, you know the next Ken Loach or the next Shane Meadows yeah um, but it was slow and it was really actually it was going into capital the kind of I suppose dovetailed with it because mm. the commission for capital was quite literally off the back of the Sarajevo Film Festival because it was the Catherine Cartlidge scholarship I was contacted by a composer called Steve Martland who okay. was best friends with Catherine and 
we met up because he lived close to me in um, Finsbury Park at the time. Yeah. And that commission came off us knowing each other um, and wanting to do something together. And it was after we'd even shooting Capital and after we shot Capital that was commissioned by the Manchester International Festival, which was a brand new music festival. Um, and we were the only film commission. It had other things like Damon Albarn doing an opera of Monkey. Right. Um, so right. artists working differently. And the festival director, Alex Poots, who was formerly from the English National Opera, he was the director of this headhunted kind of for it because he was very much about new commissions. So he commissioned me and Stephen. The whole um, setup of the festival really gave us a lot of press. Yeah. And because... The plague at that then that time we're talking about two thousand and six yeah, 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 um, was picked up for a for distribution by a kind of independent distributor yeah uh, so it kind of then hit HMV did a cinema run um, sold the rights to the BBC and because of the Manchester International Festival they were also getting us lots of press yeah um, for the two films because it it naturally kind of fit yeah yeah, yeah okay. it, you know they had a lot to get out of the play getting more promotion yeah um so yeah the play kind of rolled into capital um so was how does that feel for you kind of going knowing that your first film is essentially now kind of bleeding into your second film i mean this is must have been a crazy time for you sure yeah it was mental because um capital was still like yeah. on a very low budget i mean yeah the budget in the end was about a hundred thousand right. on capital, but the problem was we had to then pay everyone. Yeah, of um, course. Because obviously we had to do it like legit. Yeah. Um, and we were trying to make a massive film, and yeah. making a film on a hundred thousand is you know difficult. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's a lot more than three and a half grand, but still the scale of what we were trying to do and the cinematographer I was working with meant you know we we wanted to do it properly yeah and then yeah of course everything that was going on with the plague like getting things like really good press mm. but then it kind of influencing friendships right yeah, and yeah, yeah. fellow filmmakers that you were working with and yeah people thinking that you'd kind of made it yeah um and in some respects your net my name was out there and the name of the film was out there yeah but financially it made nothing like literally nothing so it must be um, so you're essentially dealing with the the presentation of you versus the reality of you sure yeah, yeah yeah and at that same time trying to make capital and yeah because of the attention the play got i really wanted to do something completely different with right. capital and i was all, I, I guess there was a lot of frustration as well because I was being judged very much on cap on, mm. on the plague. Yeah. And really it was, you know, it was made by a 22, 23 year old and three and a half thousand yeah, pounds. Of course, of course. And it was, had a lot of faults about it. Um, but it was interesting. I mean, seeing how the, the kind of publicity machine works with things like that, seeing how, um, you know, all the film magazines that were, were reviewing it during its cinematic release. Mm. It's like, they were just basically regurgitating the press release yeah. that I had put out. Half, yeah. You know, half the time it was like that. Um, so it's weird seeing how that kind of world of publicity operates and yeah. at, at times feeling under a spotlight slightly. Yeah. A, I don't want to be over dramatic. It wasn't like yeah. I'd made it or anything. And that's the point really. I, yeah. I just made one film that got a bit of attention and got a bit of publicity. And for me, it helped me establish a name for myself um but yeah it was also at times kind of an albatross around my neck slightly yeah, because course. it was also something difficult and with capital i wanted to shrug that off completely mm. and again with capital it was a learning curve i was 25 yeah when i made capital and i had a lot of pressure because there was also the fact it was it was premiering at this festival yeah um so i had a lot of publicity around uh, focused on it yeah so already it wasn't i was just making a film and i could take my time with it no or just making a film to to improve my craft i it was even though it was those things i was improving my craft it also had a premiere date yeah yeah so i was working with a date date for the premiere which was july the 4th 2007 so you know we spent the whole of 2006 making it Mm. knowing that there was a date for it to premiere to an audience yeah um 
so there, there was it did feel like there was a bit of pressure on that and, and it was a learning curve and then you know when it did screen and it got some quite bad reviews really okay and I, you know I think it wasn't judged in the light really of me still being 25 still learning yeah of course um, so still very proud of some of the stuff I've achieved with it and, and there's even recent like last year when I screened that film out in Mexico mm. there is a really great audience for some yeah. people that get it get it and yeah. um, it sits a lot better for me now that I'm on feature number four, I can kind of put it. You can separate. Yeah. yeah. At the time, all yeah, my eggs yeah. were in that basket. Yeah. And it was also quite a hard come down. Of course. From Capital, because once it had, you know, the festival had five sellout screenings. Yeah. But boom, then that was it. It's, Whereas Plague was the opposite. You say obviously you had the specific date to start shooting it. What was the process like in actually, you know, developing the the scripts uh, and the project? Yeah, I mean Capital. Off the back of the plague, actually, I was writing a script called Strangers in a Strange Land, which was meant to be my second feature. Okay. Um, and but and obviously the commission for Capital kind of came through that meeting with Steve Martin and meeting with Alex Poots and the Manchester International Festival kind of commission. And Alex came at it as that it was a film um, to music project. Right, okay. Because yeah. the whole festival was based around music. Um, I obviously didn't have script ideas I mean we went to Manchester I met with Alex kind of spent a bit of time in Manchester I basically had the idea of taking four fairy tales and stripping them down to their core narrative and setting them in contemporary Manchester and interweaving them yeah so I wanted to take very dark stories um, from very different cultures so it basically started as a five page outline Right, okay. Um, and then when it came to doing it, m me and Becky, my sister, produced The Plague, moved to Manchester, and we spent three months. We cast from actors um, when we were up in Manchester, so no one we'd worked with ever before. And we basically created a process, and Becky was really heavy in helping facilitate this and, and creating this, that we basically worked with the actors. None of them knew what... Th the stories were a lot of the actors none of the four stories ever crossed anyway so they were all quite separate and even within those stories some of the actors never met each other except on screen for the first time okay that's interesting and the point of the process was we created three months to develop the characters uh, they worked differently because one of the stories was about a, a couple um, so for example over that three month process they met for the first time and we ran all the scenes of their relationship up until the point of the actual film. Yeah. And the thing was, he was actually a married man and she didn't know. She was a character who um, suffered from depression and had tried committing suicide before, again, saying he didn't know. Yeah. So we built that and the bit that was actually in the film is him, you know, the revelation that he is married. Yeah, and yeah. she is pregnant. Uh, she gives him the revelation that she's pregnant. But then one of the other stories was about four homeless people. Yeah. And with them, it was very different. We created their kind of characters. We did animalization techniques. We sent them out over three months begging um, in character for hours. Wow. Um, and I mean, this one of the first, this was the first time I met like Paul. Yeah, um, yeah. Who acts obviously in SSDD and in Bruised and Communion. And he played a character that suffered from schizophrenia. Yeah. So we often played with the scale. We'd send him out. Um, and, you know, the scale might be a four. It might be an eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we built those characters who spent time amongst the real homeless community. But then the first day of filming with them, that morning, mm. they were woken by an angel. And we actually woke them up. Wow. Uh, and they saw <laughs> the angel for the first time on the screen. And she delivered for all four of them a very personal message that was written because we knew all their backstories. Yeah, of course. Um, and it basically, they all broke down. And then for the whole of filming, their heads were somewhere completely yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. They thought it was going to be a social realist film and then went somewhere else. Wow. And the other key story was obviously the story um, based on Prince Tabaldo, which is an incest story. It's about the loss of a mother. Okay. And the father wants to marry his daughter. Yeah. And a prince saves her. Now, in the setting for Capital, it was about a father and a daughter. 
and she was having a relationship with a boyfriend he knew nothing about. Right. Um, and the the actress playing the young girl didn't know that the father was actually going to really rape her until wow. the shoot. But with that, I mean, we did lots of interesting things. Like we had an actress, uh, Claire Barry, who's in SSDD and yeah. Communion. She was involved in the rehearsal process, but this is how it worked. When we first met with the father and the daughter, yeah. we gave them a, an array of photos of Claire from different periods of time in her life. And we were giving them exercises where they'd do hot seat stories yeah. about when that photo was taken, you know, maybe the father, yeah, yeah. they were in Spain and it was a, a restaurant. So for three months, they had this image of this woman, they had all the photos, they built up these stories about her. Then one of the final rehearsals, um, it was set in one day, and I think they'd just come back from parents' evening, and she wasn't doing so well. So the first scene we did with the father and daughter was when they just got back, and right. he had a go at her, really told her off, and then sent her to bed. And then he passed out in the living room because he was drunk. We sent the actress home, who was playing the daughter. Then with the father, that next scene of him falling asleep, we said an element was going to wake you up, but you will remain in character for the whole exercise. So he started the, the scene drinking, falling yeah, asleep. Yeah, yeah. And then we brought in Claire and sat her down as his wife. He'd never met her before. And she woke him up. Wow. And she said stuff to him in character, then put him back to sleep and left. And then afterwards, we woke him up, finished the exercise. He never met her, ever. Wow. Um, He's only seen her through the photos, isn't he? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then again, we finished with him, sent him home, brought back Angela that played the daughter, um, continued the fact that she'd gone up to her bedroom. Yeah. We then began the exercise the same, said she'd gone to sleep. Mm. So we started, she went to sleep. We then brought Claire in, who started singing a song that Angela said, this is what, you know, um, Elizabeth's mum used to sing her. So Claire came in singing that and delivered a whole monologue to her. Um, and she, Angela was in tears. And then again put her to sleep and left. Mm. And Angela didn't meet her until the premiere of the film. Wow. So these are all things we were doing in the prep. Yeah. Um, trying out loads of different kind of ways of devising a film. Yeah. Um, and then when we unique. shot, we shot in chronological order. Yeah. So all four stories were shot, you know, one per week. And showing all the characters like the dad and the boyfriend from that story met on camera for yeah. the first time. They never met as actors or wow. anything of the sort. And it's, a, it's a, quite a brave way of approaching a film. It's a very, I mean, for, I mean, I'm thinking as a filmmaker myself, it's not something I would necessarily be comfortable with doing, you know, but... No, you've got a release date coming up. You know, you've got you know, it's set in stone. You've got this commission. You've got this this music to, that you've got to work with, and then you know essentially you then have to devise this whole project, mm -hmm. knowing for well that you know as with these new people and not knowing necessarily how they're going to react. I mean, so what was the shoot like itself? How did that feel? The shoot was together? grueling, and to be fair, the second day, yeah. the adapter, we were filming on a Z1, but right. with an adapter with film lenses. Yeah. The second day, the adapter broke down, and it was the only <laughs> one in the whole of the UK. Yeah, the, other, the other adapter was in Europe. Yeah. So I remember that end of day of filming, walk, I, I had to just walk away, and I was walking around this... Um, suburban kind of estate yeah thinking fuck we're shooting this yeah. film in chronological order which yeah. means I can't move things around no you can't this can't. is day two of it was actually a five week shoot wow um, and I was like all this money's resting on it it's got to be a premiere all this pressure's yeah, on my shoulders because it's my course. second film and the plague done so well yeah that that was a dark dark Thoughts going through my head, but we pulled it back. Yeah. The adapter started working the next day <laughs> and went for the whole shoot. Um, but it was grueling. I remember with the actual, I had a, a kind of folder. Yeah. And I had different versions of the script. I had like a yellow script, which was the four stories separate. Yeah. That was given to the crew. Yeah. The cast were allowed no script. No. Then there was a green script, which was all the scenes from all the all the stories intercut so yeah, basically yeah, yeah. how the film will play out in the edit almost like the edit, um, edit script itself yeah it? yeah yeah and okay. then I think I just had like a book of kind of storyboards um, 
and notes and sketches really yeah of course um, so it's kind of directed that way yeah but it's very I mean the cinematographer I work with you see yeah uh, created like paintings really but it was a completely different way than I'd work with Leo who shot The Plague which of is course. very much a documentary yeah. a very stylistic kind of dom- a documentary so the styles were completely polar opposites yeah and the whole kind of dramatic process of it then the whole thing filming process of it yeah of course it was it was fucking mammoth yeah 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 of course. it was hard on a hundred thousand yeah um, i'm still very like i say very proud of what i achieved of course and um, the fact we had to then edit the film to the score so yeah. steve martland composed all the music without seeing any of the film and we had to edit the film to his music it was it was it was a crazy exercise but I mean, you have to understand that commission in my contract. Yeah. I had final cut. Yeah, of course. And complete creative freedom. Yeah, of course. Uh, so. And it, you're still a young filmmaker at this point. Completely, Very 25. Young. Yeah, 25. Yeah. So, I was learning still. It of was a massive learning curve. And yeah. Yeah, it, as I think I said before, it sits so much better now. Now I'm on feature number four. Absolutely. At the time finishing capital yeah was it was almost like because the plague and capital had kind of blended into each other yeah everything had built and built and built and built and then boom yeah of the capital i mean i i had a script i think it was called dark night of the soul yeah again like strangers in a strange land this was a script that got shelved but i was going around them for about 18 months going from different people warp yeah um you know meet with different producers film four I was doing lots of talks. Yeah. I, mean, I think I even did a talk for Film 4. Yeah. And my they, they had a portrait of me, actually. An artist painted me and put me on the front page of their magazine. Wow. wow. So, again, it's like, here I am, painted yeah. by a famous um, S- Stephen Earl Jones, I think his name, is painter on the front of Film 4 magazine, but not getting commissioned yeah, by them yeah. and, and going around the houses for 18 months with this next script. And, and really not getting anywhere. Yeah, um, it's, it's tough. Kind of had the rights to a book called Basher Rich by Ian Bone. So mm-hmm. also at the same time, trying to get a, a script funded through the industry, um, or the industry route, I should say. Okay. Then also adapting Ian's book, so I was spending a lot of time with Ian. Um, <clears throat> and even then when going, in, basically adapting Basher Rich, because I knew I was going to shelve the one that wasn't getting funding. Right. Um, which was trying to go the industry route. Then I was just trying to adapt Bash the Rich, which is a film, a book set from the 50s up until the 90s. Yeah. Um, so I have this script, but it covers so much from the minor strike to the poll tax, the Brixton riots, yeah, yeah. to the hippies. It's like, wow, I need a budget for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just not in that place yet. No. So really, SSDD came out on a necessity to make another film. Right. At the time... To come full circle, yeah. one of the rappers that kind of really influenced me when making The Plague was Jest. Yeah. Because he had a um, kind of a album release called The Return of the Drifter, which was again saying, the, I think one of the first UK hip-hop CDs I actually bought. Because it kind of got beyond yeah. the point of just being vinyl releases yeah, to yeah, then yeah. getting into HMV with a CD release. Um, and that was a, a rapper who's kind of, not just this artistic output, but the fact his distribution output had an influence on the plague and by the time SSDD came around I was actually living with him right, so okay, I'd be making yeah, yeah. music videos with Jest and it was him really that we were having this big chat and he was like you just got to make another film yeah. you've got to get back out there um, and, and really SSDD then I had a few phone calls with Sammy and Isaac who were in the plague yeah. and got them to basically come up um, and meet me in my flat and we were started knocking around a story yeah yeah but i also wanted to take it a different way um because also there was some of the actors i work with on capital so basically with ssdd i knew i wanted to say actors from the plague actors from capital yeah. about eight to ten of them and do something simple yeah and also at that time i'd visited the moth club um, which is where the all the action is pretty much set for the entire film. Okay. Um, so I kind of had this location. I had the, the title. All these elements were there, basically. Kind of fitting in. Yeah, yeah, yeah everything yeah. was fitting in. And um, that's really where SSDD came from. I think I phoned Becky um, and met up with her and basically said, yep, I have, I have an idea for a film. 
Um, it's called Same Shit Different Day, SSDD. Yeah. And she's like, what's it about? So basically you've gone from um, having a title, a location, some actors, but you know, uh, after speaking with Becky, you don't actually know what it's about. So fill me on how that devising process actually works. How do you do that? How do you... Um, well, the scenes were broken down into a seven-page outline. Yeah. Met with the... Got all the actors in. Day one was um, just having them on their own for about yeah. an hour each and just doing a, a kind of brainstorm around their character. Yeah. Giving them some information that I kind of knew and then, you know, leaving lots of blanks for them to fill in and, and just chat and create it. Then they went away, I think, then the next couple of days. Then we did a whole day of a group workshop mm. where we just had all the actors together and Becky just ran all different games, theatre games. And then at the end of that session, we all ran hot seats. So we had every actor be their character, being interviewed by mm. all of us um, for, you know, half an hour at a time. Um, so that was early on. Then we moved into looking at each scene and calling the actors together for those scenes, creating those where I filmed them, mm -hmm. then sat over Christmas, transcribed the whole thing, then sent them the script at the start of January, but basically when we started filming. Yeah, 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 so, of course. And even as we were filming, I was writing scenes as well, Yeah. Um, which was a bit nuts. I would be in the middle of filming, and that night I'd have to go home and write the scene that we were shooting in two days. So a lot of the actors were like, shit, I need that, and, you know, need that script, that mm. scene. And then I'd send it to them the day before filming, and they're like, this is five pages of dialogue. What the <laughs> fuck? Um... So, you know, there's many on set. Yeah. I mean, the thing with SSDD, the way it's shot, I wanted it all to be handheld. I wanted it to shoot like a documentary. Yeah. And the biggest thing with SSDD is that I break the continuity rule. Yeah. Um, you know, like, it cuts and pe drinks are in different places. Yeah. You know, people's expressions may be completely different. And at one point, I even did it on purpose where it cuts to and fro between a fight. The one the characters is on the floor, then he's up, then he's on the floor, then he's yeah, up. Yeah. But because of the chaos of the fight, yeah. it actually worked. Yeah. And again, because of the nature of the film, because it was shot like a documentary, it has a and, feel, the, and the performances are very real, that I could break the continuity law, yeah, yeah. which, but it doesn't jar the audience. Actually, it reinforces that universe of realism that I was creating for SSDD. That was the whole point of kind of SSDD and... I think with all of my films, mm. I'm constantly striving for a sense of what I kind of see as like hyper realism. Yeah, yeah. The cinema is like it's so constructed, and because I've I edit my own stuff, is so much about manipulation and creating a world, and that's the thing about realism is like you push the cinema to such a point that it kind of becomes self reflexive. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. You know, like breaking the continuity rule of SSDD is reinforcing to the audience that they're watching a film. Yeah, of course it but is. But because you're reinforcing they're watching a film, for some reason it heightens the reality of the performances exactly. and the ideas that they're um, ingesting or, you know, mm. communicating with. Um, so, yeah, SSDD was kind of... that. It was a culmination of, quite literally, yeah. the plague in Capital by the fact that I was using... The same actors, but very much at that point, a kind of culmination of where I was as a filmmaker. Yeah, and I think with SSDD, the plague and capital were so kind of under the spotlight, mm. and I was so judged on them. But I was never really um, content with them. No, but by SSDD, um, I was I was content with a film. So going into SSDD. How long have you been making films now? When, when are we talking? What year are we in? Um, we shot it in January 2009 and it was completed. It had its cast and crew screening um, 2010 and then opened the Portobello Film Festival. Of course, yeah. September 2010. So that's a couple of years back now. Um, yeah. I think I was 28. So you've yeah. been working solidly as a filmmaker essentially for... You know, best part of a decade by this point, really. You know, you know, coming up to. Kind of. Um, yeah. I mean, you've what twenty? How old were you start with the play? So you started. No, twenty three. So it's on under a decade. So okay. So for most of your twenties, then you've been shooting films. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You've been making films. You you're opening Portobello Film Festival. 
Um, the film did very well at Portobello, didn't it? You did very well. Yeah, I picked up Best Script Awards um, yeah. and opened the festival, which of was course. a great honour. And I just remember the screening at the pop-up cinema was just so packed out and yeah. it just went down so well. It was so well received and yeah. that was the important thing for me. So over those three films then, uh, really I guess what, what I'm kind of asking is, you come into SSDD, a film where you're you know, finally finding your voice, uh, I would assume, and mm -hmm. like you say, it's a culmination of previous works as well. Um, what's that process like once you get to try to sell that film, try to market that film? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, work? with SSDD, I, I didn't have any clear plan, really. Right. Um, it was when I started making it, as I say, it was kind of a title, yeah. <clears throat> very ad hoc, and I was kind of making video diaries, yeah. putting them online. Um, so it was very much like making it on nothing and there was the idea of putting it out myself but yeah. I hadn't really thought that through to be honest with okay. you we um, were accepted into a big buyers and sellers market put on by Film London at the BFI mm. um, so I think that was in 2010 as well later in no, it might be 2011 I think it was a year later actually okay. yeah it was um, in the summer of 2011 it was around my birthday and that was where we screened to all kind of buyers and sellers, um, sales agents. But it didn't, no one picked it up. No. Um, bizarrely, I'd entered it into, the reason I made SSDD so quickly was to enter yeah. into the London Film Festival, yeah. where the Playgood did so well. And I sent them a, a copy, and it got rejected. Right. Um, so that was kind of, I think, uh, start of 2010. Got yeah. rejected. Then... A year later, it got requested by London Film Festival yeah. to be screened, to viewed again a yeah. year later, but and then got rejected again. So, wow. like, oh. um, and I kind of been waiting around a lot for that, and it, it was a real shame because I felt like I'm a London filmmaker. This is where my work yeah, should be on the, the biggest platform in you know my city, um, and it just didn't happen. It didn't yeah. have the projection that the plague had, and I suppose in some respects. I was hoping that if I just make a film mm. and try and go the same avenues that the play had kind of burrowed into and even Capital yeah. to some sense had come out of that I thought that you know bang we'd get a good bit of press it would yeah, sell yeah, itself yeah. Yeah. but it didn't really um, and mm. the hard thing was was the plague and Capital had gone that way and here was basically what I considered my best film mm. you know really polished the story was clear. The performances were great all round. Shot and constructed, in a you know just happy, very content with mm. it. Yet, it wasn't going anywhere. No. I mean, it screened in two thousand eleven at the London Independent Film Festival, yeah. where it picked up best feature in the no budget category. So it's getting critical acclaim. So yeah, it's getting and mm. every screening we had, yeah, went down really well. Everyone yeah, loved yeah, yeah. it. Of course, of course. But still now, I mean, SSDD is kind of getting screenings. And yeah. um, it still seems to be going down with an yeah. audience. But in the end, I, I just sold it as a DVD of Broke by Making Films. Yeah. Um, but I didn't really give any drive towards it. No. Or, you know, publicise it, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, so it's never really had a yeah. proper distribution. But I think, the, the, again, these, these, again, it all kind of alludes back to why I'm asking about because... I feel in a lot of ways that your career has kind of landed at the same time that the business model is changing and you've, you've kind of seen the the changes. And I think by the time you get to SSDD, you know, the old model that you were essentially kind of looking at is kind of not there anymore anyway, you know. So mm. it's, it's a big part of it, you know. For, for I mean, that's what it seems like to me as a filmmaker. Looking at where you're at you know, now, you know, I mean... Literally at the moment, you're just about finishing principal photography on your fourth feature. Communion, yeah. yeah Communion, yeah. yeah. So, um, before we get too far into that, I want to talk about the jump from SSDD to Communion. What happens there? What do you do in the meantime? Okay, I mean, in the meantime, around the time of SSDD, I was kind of very politically active. Yeah. Um, okay. And that was something like all my work has been very kind of vocal mm -hmm. and really I'd kind of been quite frustrated getting yeah. all the spotlight and attention from my films. Yeah. And I actually wasn't fully sure if I wanted to be a filmmaker and was using films to vocalise myself and my views and opinions on the world. 
I mean, around SSDD, SSDD is like my most political film in some respects. Yeah. And at the time, I was really kind of involved in activist politics um, throughout the UK of that period. And, you know, I was kind of buzzing off that and mm. learning lots, learning lots and lots, actually. Um, so it's kind of nice being removed a little bit from the filmmaking world. Yeah. Um, and not having so much focus on that, but being able to kind of articulate how I see the world and, and, yeah, and how course. I want to communicate in other avenues. And then really, I mean, I had a baby as well. I had a yeah. daughter. <laughs> so, so I was living life really. And, you know, still getting by, still having a studio to cut with, doing lots of teaching work, um, working with young people and teaching filmmaking yeah. um, with them. But, you know, I got to a point of, you know, 2012 basically, in October 2011, I was invited out to Mexico to Cinema mm. Global, which was kind of out of the blue because mm. the plague I'd done all stuff going to Europe, even ended up going to New York um, to all festivals. Capital, not so much. SSDD was pretty much a London thing. Yeah. So getting invited out to Cinema Global in October 2011, where I was asked to screen all three of my features mm. as part of a festival that is a like thematic film festival. So it took the, it's called Anarchism and Cinema. So it's right. t- taking the whole kind of punk DIY kind yeah, of approach, yeah, yeah. very political kind of films. Mm. And I was there as a guest, ran a workshop, five days with filmmakers from Mexico and screened all three of my features, yeah. which was nuts. Uh, you know, yeah. SSDD opened to like over 500 people. Wow. And again, it went down so well in Mexico. Yeah. So I came back from that really buzzing mm. that, wow, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of relevant as a filmmaker and going to a country I'd never been to before yeah. and being able to screen my work. And then kind of coming back and being like, you know, saying what people had noted was I'd made a film every three years. Yeah, yeah, of course. So it dawned on me that 2012, I have to make a feature to come out in 2013 yeah. to keep up that three year um you know yeah, uh, keep, trajectory keep yeah yeah to keep the yeah. rhythm going so early 2012 yeah i phoned paul stevens who's an actor from capital yeah and does the big cone in the barbarian speech in ssdd yeah so he's an actor i really enjoyed collaborating with um, full of enthusiasm and ideas just fantastic to work with mm. we met in um, i think the bfi and south bank it was at the start of 2012 this year now. Um, I think it was in March. We met in mm. March. I said to him, we've got to shoot a film at the end of the year. It's going to be set in London. It's going to be set in Mexico. Mm. He was like, well up for it. And he was like, yeah, but let's make a short straight away, like now. Mm. He, he threw this idea at me around the title, Bruised. We went back to the studio, wrote it in a day. And then a month later, we had shot it. A month after that, you know, we shot it in April. Yeah. And by May, it premiered, as you know, yeah. we did Bootleg in Toronto. It was crazy. Um, we then did Edinburgh with Right Shoe Cut, you know, a couple of days after. Yeah. Then at the West London Film Network launch, yeah. and then online. So within a succession of like five days, you know, a month after we just mm. shot it, I think less actually, you know, we screened it at three places led by filmmakers mm. and then put it out for free online. Yeah. Um, so Bruised was basically the springboard for communion. Yeah. So that's May time. Yeah, of course. Then we started basically, we'd been trying to write the Project Mexico idea over Bruised. Yeah. But it got to a point where we were just coming up against a brick wall. We'd held auditions and met Anna, who um, is the actress in communion, Anna Gonzalez Bello, yeah. who plays Maria. We'd met her, but for the Project Mexico idea, yeah. which is completely different. And then just, I think it was the day of the West London Film Network screening of Bruised, me and Paul scrapped the idea. We had Mm. no idea. So this is like mid-May. We went for a walk and suddenly we came up with this idea of this priest on a road trip with a baseball bat, (laughs) with a picks up a Mexican punk and the title Communion. From mid-May, we started writing it. Yeah. Um, We crowdfunded it June, July. Shot it in September, and you know it's looking like it's probably gonna have it be screening in two thousand thirteen. I mean, it's gonna have its cast and crew screening 
under 11 months yeah. of us coming up with the idea. That's the turnaround. And we're planning to do our own release. Yeah. So by the time people are seeing it, you know, it's not even going to be much over a year no. from literal the idea to yeah. raising the cash, shooting it and putting it out. It's nuts. Obviously, I've, I've been involved, you know, a lot behind the scenes on Comedian and, you know, I, I've seen a lot of it, but obviously, you know, most people won't know too much about it yet. Um, and I don't want to ask too much. <laughs> but um, the interesting thing about going from Bruised in particular is, uh, and this is for me where it started really, obviously, we screened it in Toronto. Um it was a it made a big impact and instantly for me you know coming back and you know seeing you obviously not too long after and then seeing you go straight into communion and being around communion um it's got a different energy entirely it's, it's yeah it's yeah. completely as a filmmaker you seem to have made some sort of shift um i'm interested in asking you about your your crowdfunding process i mean how vital was that in, you know, in terms of getting this thing off the ground? I mean, it must have been... Yeah, crowdfunding was kind of key, really. I mean, yeah. before SSDD, with the build-up to it, like I said, I made kind of video diaries yeah. and created quite a buzz around SSDD during the kind of pre-production. and So, you know, people knew about it and kind yeah. of had like this plan, but then that f dropped off uh, yeah. because the post took so long. But when it came to communion and crowdfunding, because I'd done that kind of video diary thing... I very much knew, and it was actually taking advice from yourself, actually, yeah, yeah. and other filmmakers that had done crowdfunding, that it was key that you have to have a team. Yeah. You have to have, like, you have to plan the whole eight weeks. Yeah. And I kind of stressed this to Becky and Paul, um, and we kind of met, and we had great sessions together mm. just on the crowdfunding. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that they were involved. It wasn't just one person doing the crowdfunding. No, no, of course. And so together we created the pricing brackets. Again, we knew not to go. £100 was our top one because predominantly our main aim was to get £15 ones Yeah. where people get the DVD. Yeah. We were like, yeah. that should be our goal because, you know, people are getting a DVD. You're basically selling pre-orders. Yeah, yeah. Um, so our whole strategy was very much a team effort mm. um, and we went into it really hit the ground running mm. and to be honest by the end of it I was like it was such an exhausting experience mm. I was like bring on the film now I can do the easy bit <laughs> yeah. I'd never raise money myself for selling pre-order DVDs no, no, of course. and it's hard it's yeah. hard yeah. but you get your audience Yeah, you've yeah. got your core audience and yeah. it's a really good position to be in actually because you're then like, okay, I've got four or five hundred people as a captive audience. Yeah. You're not even shot a frame of it. No, no, of course. That's great build that's a great building block. Yeah. Um, when we talk about like this new model of independent filmmaking, which is the distribution is key to it. And yeah. I mean when we talk about, you know, the plague as I mentioned earlier, yeah, was yeah. the second ever feature film to try out an online distribution yeah 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 and now but now we're in a position where it's completely different yeah the technology is different yeah everything's different the whole um, landscape is different for strange. independent film um so going from crowdfunding into the actual development of communion and again i'm i don't necessarily want to discuss too much about the, the film itself um just yet but developing the the plots and the characters how did how did you go about doing that yeah i mean it was me and paul obviously writing together yeah. again off the back of bruised yeah it's the first time we collaborated as writers so really i mean me and paul we wrote a couple of drafts of the script and it was us locked away together you know just bouncing ideas off each other and writing you know constantly in kind of 24 hour 48 hour yeah. sessions um, <clears throat> then we kind of got the two main actors. There wasn't any dialogue in the script. Right. Um, there was an ongoing joke that always said dialogue to be devised <laughs> when it got to big scenes of monologues. <laughs> um, we got Anna and Paul together. Yeah. And basically devised, similar to SSDD, we tried out the scenes, filmed them, tried them out in different ways. And from that, we were able to create uh, a script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Also, as part of that process um, of kind of creating the characters, I mean, Becky, again, was heavily involved yeah. in helping to facilitate a creative um, rehearsal process 
because she comes from the point of view of an actor and the fact she's now a drama therapist, yeah. she was bringing uh, what I believe is called the sesame technique of drama therapy. So we were using lots of exercises around kind of Jungian archetypes um, and looking at kind of dream and um, yeah. visualization exercises, trying out lots of different things really. So that was part of that process of creating the two main characters. Um, that was the build up to communion mm. and there, there was a full script there. A lot of that was created from the actors um, like Paul and Anna mm. and then scenes with some of the other actors um, when it's smaller scenes, sometimes it's stuck to the dialogue that's been yeah. written. Sometimes it's, the dialogue has been thrown out completely yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's been improvised. So there's still been like a, a process even during the actual production of kind of devising an improvisation and I mean, Paul as an actor is always throwing things at me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm always throwing things as a director into the mix. There's little moments I remember we'd lit um, the car mm. at night, perfectly, beautifully lit, very kind of surreal and quite stylized. And Anna got in to the car and me and Nick were just looking through the, the, the lens, mm. um, looking at the LCD screen on the 7D. And suddenly Anna just popped down the mirror to check her makeup before we were going to go for a take. And she popped open, obviously, the mirror that folds down and it just lit her. Right. And me and Nick looked at each other and we were like, that's <laughs> incredible. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it was an accident. And then I told Anna that, you know, you've got to get that in the scene. That, yeah. Yeah. So then it ended up in the scene and then Paul was like, oh, but I would close it for her. Right. So again, it's like little it's elements, like, in, yeah, yeah, little details where it's important for the characters and it just makes the scenes grow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even though the script... The script was only 58 pages when it did have mm. dialogue in. Yeah. But we still knew it was going to be a 90-minute film. Yeah. Because uh, there was space within those little scenes where for things to play out and, and, and develop um, the weight of those scenes, even though that sometimes they kind of transition between bigger kind of monologues and stuff. There's always the space of things that grow, which is great kind of still having that fluid process even when working with like a you know a full length script yeah it's funny actually talking about that that process of it of it developing as you were going because um obviously you haven't been you know behind the scenes on it seeing it all coming together um uh, thematically it's bigger than anything you've ever done i think it's safe to say that you yeah know, yeah thematically physically you know i mean there's a there's a lot going on in terms of the amount of people in the film um, and stylistically it's, it feels like a much bigger film I think I've said a few times it feels like a much bigger film cinematically I mean what does that feel like going to that to that next level yeah it feels feels right you know nothing yeah. it's funny doing this kind of talk with you talking yeah, yeah. from like the first short film I made from the age of 14 and being here now at like 31 and pretty much finishing up as you say the principal photography on feature number four communion everything feels like a natural progression yeah. it doesn't actually there, there's never been a moment with this film or really with any of the other films where that felt forced yeah it's okay. all been a very natural process and progression so communion was just right yeah just as much as bruised ssdd capital plague da 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 da, da. Yeah, it all felt that. right you know yeah 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 um of course and yeah it, it feels good i feel I want to get cutting. Uh, yeah. I want to get editing. I can't wait. Yeah. We have everything we've shot, I really feel that there's gold there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's cinematic gold. It's so exciting. It's not like, you know, I didn't really, I try not to compromise on this. Yeah, and even yeah, though this film, say, yeah. yeah, this film was made for like nine and a half grand. It's crazy. Which is actually less than SSDD. But the, you know, it's, I think it's like 600 pounds less than SSDD's budget yeah. it's about six times more ambitious yeah yeah um, so it's not lost anything it's it's multiplied in some respects and it just feels exciting I, I just want to screen it yeah I just want to get the film to the audience yeah. ASAP I'm, I'm itching to just get it out what's interesting actually watching you work behind the scenes definitely on this film and this is the first time I've seen you working you know actually yeah. rather than just seeing your work this is the first time I've seen you piecing it together and there's definitely this element of no compromise. And you also had the one thing, I, I always say that an, a director says one thing constantly, you know. A director always has their one phrase. 
and your one phrase that kept coming up was let's do this you, know, <laughs> you said that almost you know let's do this and that became kind of the mantra for everyone on the film you know it kind of became this um it became the way that everyone approached the, the problems that, yeah. did, that did come up and I, yeah and i wonder how you know where does that come from where does that that approach come from i mean is that just is that a natural progression or is that always been with you um i mean it, a lot of that comes down to the team yeah the team that's been created i mean i've been working with becky my sister since before my features yeah she's been there for every feature yeah, yeah. the short films before having worked with paul on this is our third feature kind of together and having done bruce with him with nick and g my cinematographer and sound guy yeah. so we did ssdd and bruce together um, and then all the other elements that have fitted in in that team, yeah. Um, everyone's gelled, yeah. And the team has been key to to be able to confidently kind of know that we can get things. And I would say with age, with yeah. my experience, it's like I know it's going to be in the can. Mm. It's just about how we get there. And I yeah, think everyone yeah, yeah. that worked on it, whether it was doing a night shoot on a beach, yeah, you know like all these elements were thrown at, at us or, or shooting like an eight minute monologue with the sunrise in the background, yeah, yeah. you know, which are both scenes in the film, <laughs> um, getting that stuff. It wasn't so much, there was never the question of doubt in our minds that we wouldn't get it. No. It was just about how do we go around getting it? Yeah. How, yeah, yeah. you know, it's just about problem solving yeah. and having that team there that you know you have full trust and confidence mm. in means you can do it and yeah. I suppose the attitude is like ever since all my films um, yeah. the, you know beginning with the plague feature wise was that let's just do this yeah, yeah. like you have to be a bit mad yeah, yeah. like you, you slightly have to be insane yeah. for anything creative I think yeah. um, just to kind of throw yourself in there and do it yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's like you're bare in your soul you're setting yourself up for, for failure. Yeah. Um, and it's such a difficult mountain to climb, but <laughs> it's better to try and climb it than just sit at the bottom and look at it. Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and that's really been the kind of course of my film career, really. Yeah. And, and like I say, that attitude is a natural progression. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Um, two questions I want to ask before we close off. Yep. Um, what would you what mistakes have you made and what wouldn't you do again and what were the the things you discovered and what would you definitely do again okay well the first one was it's one mistakes yeah and what wouldn't you do twice over the, the the course of your career so far what wouldn't i do yeah that's quite difficult okay because you know what that i wouldn't say i wouldn't have not done anything because okay. Even all the things that weren't successful, I've learned from that, okay. and I've tried to move forward with the other pro with the next film, and keep that will of progression in motion. So I would say, everything I've learned from, so that I wouldn't really try right, and I'm change right. any mistakes actually, because it's from making those mistakes that you learn how to overcome those mistakes, and that's kind of again my whole attitude to filmmaking is. The only way you can make films is by going out and doing it. If you can't talk about it, you know, the amount of people you meet where they're like, I've got this idea for a film, I've got an idea for yeah. a film. Great, go make it. Show me the film. And for me, like communicating, I find it really hard pitching an idea. Mm. Because I might go off on a tangent and start talking about like quite a thing that might not be part of it, but like have to be explained and... I kind of lose that point of like I have to sell it yeah, yeah, um, yeah. because really how I want to communicate that idea is by showing you the final yeah, film yeah, 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 yeah. and that's the thing with communion I want to show you the film so I can go that's what I meant yeah 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 that's, that's why crowdfunding was so hard because it's like I'm trying to <laughs> you know people have to buy a DVD of something that's not been made yet yeah and how do you tell them what it is without making it so really I would say you know there are mistakes. There are things, you know. It's like your health does get battered. My health over the years. Right. You know, um, I've had like shingles twice. Um, at the end of Capital, I was kind of in A&E with when I had shingles the second time. Um, so my general health yeah. has taken quite a pounding. Um, but 
you know, you, you just keep on keeping on, I think. Yeah, and keep going on. Yeah, I can't can't okay. really think of... Anything you wouldn't do, no? No, because yeah. you know what? It's life, man. And yeah. life is about making mistakes. Of and course. Of course, there's been times where, you know, off the back of the plague, I was offered features, you know, with like a million budget. Yeah. And there's times now when I think like, man, I could have taken that paycheck. <laughs> I should yeah. have done advertising. Yeah. I shouldn't have gone down this route of being like this angry anarchist filmmaker. Yeah. That's, you know, making work and just being creative. Yeah. Not to make money, just to express myself and just yeah. to communicate with people. So at times, you know, when I'm so broke, it makes me feel like, yeah, maybe I should have you know, more kind of capitalized on these skills or exploited these yeah. skills for monetary means but you know fuck yeah. that and, you know <laughs> fuck that completely that would be the mistakes yeah that would be the mistakes to say that off the back of the plague I made this whack film yeah yeah that I'm yeah, not yeah, proud yeah. of That's and everything cool. I've made I'm proud of Good. and the life I've kind of led I'm proud of and I think you know that's the main thing at the end of the day. Of course, you know? of course. Well, seriously, it's been great just to sit down and have this conversation with you, man. Cool. So, thanks for making the time. Cool.